Do decisions of the Michigan Supreme Court have any impact on the day-to-day -day activities of a family? Judge Kelly. Oh, I think they do. I think that more than ever in the past that people are realizing that the decisions of the Supreme Court matter. I mean, I can just name a few. And of course, you know, as judges and as potential and hopefully uh, Supreme Court justices next year, we're limited in what we can talk about. We can't talk about any decisions that might come before us as justices if we win. So some of our comments have to be restricted to comments that are appropriate, proper under these circumstances. Running to, for a judge is different than running for, say, a state rep where, you know, your candidate can tell you, I'm going to vote for this and I'm going to to, you know, have this bill and I'm going to do that. We really can't do that. So I know it's a little frustrating for people that everybody would like to know what we would do, but we can't talk about things that might come before us. But in terms of how these decisions over recent times have affected families, one of the ones that we hear about all the time as we crisscross the state is that the legislature decided that pensions could be taxed. And uh, that issue was taken before the Michigan Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decided on a four to three vote that it was constitutional to tax pensions of people that had already earned those pensions. And there's a lot of conversation about that across the state, and certainly that affects a lot of people in this state in an automobile industry state. Teachers pensions, GM pensions, Ford pensions, a lot of people were affected by that decision. Um, there are decisions that come out on a regular basis about no-fault insurance. And I think this is one of the areas that has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, in case you don't understand how it works in no-fault insurance, you are required to have insurance. And if you're in an accident, then your own insurance company pays your medical costs that are associated with your accident, your you know, lost wages as well, and some other incidentals. We call those first-party cases. There have been 26 cases that have been decided by this Supreme Court, by Justice Markman in particular, uh, regarding these benefits by people who have paid their insurance premiums all these years and then they have an accident and they require the benefits that they paid for. In 26 of those cases, Justice Markman has decided in favor of the insurance company and against the consumer 26 times. So I think that's an area of law where everybody is impacted because we're required by law in Michigan to have no-fault insurance. And so I don't think you have to be a judge to look at those statistics and say it's hard to believe that the insurance company should win in 100% of the cases. So those are just two examples of, I think, how decisions by the Michigan Supreme Court have impacted families. Well, I can just say generally without even talking about cases, when you think about what the Supreme Court does here, is they're the final decision maker of how the law is interpreted, if there's any ambiguity in it, and they're the final decision makers on particular ways the law is applied to certain sets of facts. And so just think about all of the types of things that affect your daily life. Your liberties are at stake. Um, whether or not you're a woman and you're discriminated against, the Supreme Court has the final say so in cases like that, where they have said if you're raped in the workplace. You don't have a right to recover against your employer, even when your employer knew that you were being harassed and you reported it. So those types of things are affecting your daily lives. Uh, just the, the normal decisions that you might make for your children and your families into the future are going to be affected by all of the types of decisions that come through this court. That's why uh, it's my firm belief, and I'm sure the others would agree, is that this is the most important uh, ba ba thing on the ballot that you could actually vote for short of who you're going to vote for at the federal level. So it's just like the law impacts what you wear, you know, how it's manufactured. The Supreme Court's going to hear a ton of different type of cases in just about every aspect of your life and it's going to affect what you can and you cannot do and that's just the same plain and simple truth of it. I, I don't want to, I, I think we could I don't, we, we don't each, each need to talk to each question. I, I agree with, with, with my colleagues here that the, the court has the last word on a host of issues that affect all of our families, really, um, how our families are structured, the environment, consumer so safety, safety, patient safety. The list is um, extremely long, and all of the decisions the court makes affect all of us in a daily way. Do you see a problem with the influx of big money into the Michigan Supreme Court races? And if so, do you have a plan to remedy it? I think everybody who has a TV has to see that the amount of money that is being um, 
flowing into political campaigns of all types has just gone over the top and it's outrageous. We were talking the other day, if you could figure out how much money that the candidates have spent and all the political contests going on right now, we could probably plug the hole in the deficit, right? It's just outrageous. But, you know, it is what it is, unfortunately, and I think that it's particularly troublesome, though, in judicial races. You know, we like to think that the judiciary is above the political fray. Our Congress and our legislature are so divided. Our country is so divided. It's very difficult to watch, I think, personally for me. But, you know, I think the judiciary should be above the fray. I think people expect the judiciary not to engage in partisan behavior. And so the addition of additional money by special interest groups give people that impression. And I think to restore integrity, to restore the trust of the electorate, it would be so much better if we could get money out of all political races, or at least limited, but particularly judicial races. There, you know, there are some reform ideas that are being floated around about how to do that. You know, if we could limit the amount of money that the candidates would spend, at least it would keep everything down. Maybe the period of time of campaigning too, and the amount spent. But, you know, the Citizens United case makes it very difficult. The U.S. Supreme Court case that says that everybody's got a First Amendment right to be able to spend as much money as they want. Um, you know, in terms of political elections has made it very difficult for people to come up with ideas that would pass constitutional muster and would take the money out of politics and especially judicial races. You know, I'll just add to that and say I totally agree with everything she said. And um, I think that Citizens United case gave those rights not only to everybody but to corporations to be able to spend as much as they want. So they're considered citizens now under that de decision. They're people too. And so I think that no one likes, you know, clandestine, you know, money coming into races. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't know who's behind it. I do agree it erodes the total integrity of the process because when you think about a court system, that's the place that you think about it doesn't matter about money. It doesn't matter. It, everything's just supposed to be fair and fairly decided and nobody's supposed to have a one-up on how justice is decided because they've sent more money into the candidates' uh, campaigns. And I think that that's really what people are starting to view it is they're buying justice. Whether that's true or not, I, I, I'll let you decide that. But that's just the, the way it looks. And it doesn't look good when you're looking at a system that's supposed to work in a totally different manner. And so I agree. I think there should be a little change there. Um, there's very uh, different proposals out there. But I think it just erodes the confidence in the system and the trust that you people have in the system uh, when you know that big money is potentially buying what looks like it's buying justice. And then you look at the way the decisions are made, and the decisions seem to meet that out when you figure that those interests seem to be winning the cases 100% of the times when it comes to things like insurance companies. So I, I do think it has a major effect, and it's a negative effect in a lot of ways. Any further comments? I mean, what they said. I, you know, if you could get money out of the process, that would be ideal. Short of that, less partisanship, more disclosure. And both of those wind each other up, and they can wind each other down. And if we could have more disclosure so we didn't have secret money, and we could have less partisanship, we'd have a court with more integrity and more fairness. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Professor McCormick, how would you characterize your judicial philosophy and the importance of the concept of stare decisis? Stare decisis is really what the um, appellate court system is based on. I mean, we have to be able to, as individuals, as businesses, as anybody who um, is operating in our democracy, we have to be able to count on the law so we can make decisions going forward. And that is um, the important role stare decisis plays um, in our judiciary. Um, it, frankly, it's, it's, a, it's a shortcut for um, what the rule of law means. Um, the role that a, a, the court plays in a constitutional democracy is different than the roles of the other branches of government, which is why Judge Kelly said, you can't, as a candidate for the Michigan Supreme Court, tell you, I'm going to get you this or I'm going to get you that. In fact, I sometimes say to supporters, you know what, all I can promise you is I might vote against you one day. <laughs> that's a really unsatisfying way to campaign, right? But the truth is, that's what the job requires. The job requires integrity, it requires independence, and it requires us um, to apply the rule of law um, as the law has been set by the people in the other branches of government. 
And that's frankly critical.